Thank you. Um, first, I very much want to thank Book People and all of you who came out, and to thank those people who might be watching this on C-SPAN uh, at any time, day or night. But <laughs> whenever it is you're watching, I appreciate that. Um, I was told by both my wife and daughter after presenting some earlier remarks uh, in April at the 92nd Street Y in New York that I should make it much shorter, uh, <laughs> which uh, I will try to do. Uh, my hope is to talk for about 15, no longer than 20 minutes, um, and then reserve a lot of time for the questions and comments and counter arguments uh, that not only do I suspect that some of you have, but I know given some of the people in this room, I know <laughs> without shadow, without you will have. And in fact, that I, I welcome. This is, we're told, <laughs> the most important election in our lifetimes. And it may be that more people believe that this year than believed it in 2008, 2004, 2000, or other elections when that is regularly uh, said. For this to be true, though, among other things, elections must in fact be decisive with genuine consequences for the making of public policy, particularly with regard to domestic policy. Um, we could have a separate conversation about the issue of presidential power with regard to foreign policy and military policy. But let me say that my primary interest in the book and in my remarks this evening is much more domestic policy and the extent to which elections do or do not bring us close to resolving important issues of domestic public policy. For the older members in this audience, there has been at least one election that did fundamentally change America, and that is 1964, um, a mere 48 years ago, um, when all of the stars were aligned not only to create a landslide victory for President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, after all, Richard Nixon got a landslide victory in 1972. But a landslide Democratic majority in the House of Senate, and let us not forget a Supreme Court of the United States that was still thoroughly under the control of liberal Democrats. For two brief shining years, or perhaps baleful years, if you don't like the great society. But for two years, for better or for worse, the United States had a government in the way that we often speak of Her Majesty, say, having a government. That is, a group of people who can, in fact, implement a party platform that can then be judged at the next election or series of elections. That is not generally the way the United States operates, uh, courtesy of the Constitution drafted in 1787 and, what I want to insist, relatively unamended thereafter with regard to the basic structures that we live under. Um, the Republican presidents since President Johnson, that is Nixon, Ford, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, not for a single day had even a single house of the Congress from their own political party. Um, I'm sorry, Ronald Reagan did have the Senate for a couple or maybe even four years, but he never had a full Congress that was Republican. Um, uh, Bill Clinton did have a full Congress that was Republican, but of course Bill Clinton was a Democrat. Uh, and so you had fragmented government. Uh, George W. Bush had a Republican Congress for a total of a bit more than four of his eight years, though Bush scarcely has a list of domestic legislative accomplishments that could rival Lyndon Johnson's or, to be fair, Richard Nixon's. Perhaps the 2012 elections will generate a unified government that will be able to pass its preferred programs. But it would certainly be foolhardy to bet on that. 
most likely, according to most observers at this time, is the more or less maintenance of the status quo, in which Barack Obama will continue to occupy the Oval Office while the Republicans continue to control, albeit by a reduced number, the House of Representatives, with the Senate at this time, I think, being up for grabs. So we should be open to the possibility that the current election will fit the Shakespearean description of sound and fury signifying nothing or very little with regard to domestic policy. And as I say, that is what I'm focusing on. Or perhaps not nothing. Consider the conclusion of Tom Friedman's column in the New York Times on April 22nd of this past year. One of many in which he expresses great concern that I certainly share about the health of our political system. He began by asking what some readers no doubt found an inflammatory question. Quote, does America need an Arab Spring? Unquote. His answer is basically yes. Quote, we can't be great as long as we remain a vitocracy rather than a democracy. Our deformed political system with a Congress that's become a forum for legalized bribery is now truly holding us back, unquote. A vitocracy allows what some would regard would call special interest to prevent the passage of legislation both supported by majorities of the electorate and in fact perhaps conducive to some coherent notion of the national interest. I began my prior book, Our Undemocratic Constitution, Where the Constitution Goes Wrong and How We the People Can Correct It, by detailing my reasons for refusing to sign a scroll at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia that invites visitors to emulate those delegates who did sign the Constitution instead of the three brave holdouts who did not. And I might interpolate that when Cynthia and I visited the National Constitution Center just this past May, she took a picture of me um, with the three um, holdouts, um, um, George With, Albert Jagari, and Edmund Randolph. Um, many of the reasons for my own holding out in 2003 at the opening of the National Constitution Center <laughs> as suggested by the book's title, that is, Our Undemocratic Constitution, related to the fact that the United States Constitution is in many ways remarkably undemocratic. Not only when compared to almost any constitution written elsewhere around the world since the end of World War II, but also when compared to the 50 other state, other constitutions, in America. The title, the full title of my book, Framed, the subtitle is America's 51 Constitutions and the Crisis of Governance. And one of the things that has now become a hobby horse of mine, and in fact will be the brunt of a course that I'll be teaching in the fall at the Harvard Law School, is that every student, particularly at our so-called elite law schools, uh, which would lead their students and graduates to believe there is only one constitution in the entire United States, to realize that's utterly false, that each state has its own constitution, and one discovers, contrary to the bad repute that state constitutions often have, particularly in elite law schools, that they're really often remarkably interesting and without exception more democratic than the United States Constitution. Um, there is a controversy now among political scientists about the degree to which the United States Constitution is continuing to serve as a model for countries around the world that are drafting new constitutions. What I find much more telling is that the United States Constitution to a remarkable and relatively unexamined degree did not serve as a model for the state constitutions 
that were drafted in this country beginning around the turn of the 19th century. Uh, if you look at various New York